Kyle Maynard is tough, real tough. He's a champion wrestler. He studied Brazilian jiu-jitsu. He can bench 420 pounds. And every day, he conquers the impossible. Emerson said, do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. Kyle began leaving a new trail the moment he entered the world. He was born without arms or legs, the result of a rare condition known as congenital amputation. Yeah, my, my parents, they had just normal, normal pregnancy. They went and saw the ultrasounds and the doctor saw that there was really nothing out of the ordinary. So they really had no idea that anything was gonna happen, you know, uh, that it'd be born different until I was. Normally, congenital amputation only affects a finger or a toe. In this case, Kyle was left with no limbs, and his parents were left with questions on how to raise their child. What really blows me away is the decisions that my mom and dad made. They had to make when they were super young. You know, my mom, she was more of like the nurturing type and wanting to help me with stuff and help me figure out how to go and do things and didn't want to see me struggle. My dad realized that by helping me do everything wasn't going to be the best solution to the problem. I'd say like, you know, learning how to eat, you know, he's got to figure out how to eat on his own or, or starve. As you can imagine, it wasn't easy, but Kyle learned the basics and soon, he wasn't just able to do the things others could do, he was doing them better. My mom tells a story about when I like, got in the closet and ripped all the clothes off the rack, and she was like partially a little ticked off at me, but partially like, wow, this is cool, like, you, you know, he did that. By the time he reached middle school, Kyle wanted to take it up a notch. One day he told his mom he wanted to go out for the football team. His mom called the coach, and the coach said, sure. So I was a nose guard playing in the middle. I thought I was going to be the quarterback, but that was a whole other story. I remember the very first football game that I played in, and one of the first plays that they ran was coming right up, right up the middle. You know, and I remember that moment in my the way I tackle people was taking my helmet and smashing it into their legs as hard as I could. In that moment, it was like I, I had found an 11-year-old, you know, version of purpose in life. At the time, Kyle was just a sixth-grade kid who had to work twice as hard to get half as far. His parents, who were Christians, had assured him that there was a grand plan for his life. Now, Kyle understood. His goal, see the impossible, beat the impossible. And I definitely, you know, was at a pretty big depth of despair at 10 years old and, you know, and really had a lot of fear over what the future was gonna be. And I was definitely at a point where I'd lost a lot of hope, you know, just didn't see a reason even to go on. And I really think that making my first tackle in football might have been what, you know, nearly saved my life. That moment fueled a competitive nature inside Kyle. So after football, he took up wrestling. And soon he was winning matches. And it wasn't long before the no-legged men winning the butt-kicking contests became a media sensation. He wrote a book called No Excuses. He also became a popular motivational speaker and made dozens of TV appearances. He is one of the most inspiring young men you will ever hear about. He's strong too, I might add. <laughs> Kyle Maynard is tough. He has to be. He has no arms or legs, but he makes up for that with an indomitable spirit, one buoyed by a faith in Christ. Part of, of Christ's message was teaching us so we could go and do way more than we think that we can. You know, he'd tell a mountain to move from here to here and it'll do it, right? And we can go and think of that like figuratively, like, oh, okay, yeah, it's just a saying, whatever. But like, no, I mean, like, what if that's the literal, what if that's the literal truth and we're just sort of like, well, okay, it's just a saying. We're so quick to go and dismiss the fact that we're able to go and do these amazing things too. And I think that being connected to something bigger than ourselves is the only way to, to reach that place. Now, normally, this is where a story ends. You have your hero, faces the great obstacle, overcomes it, and lives happily ever after. But in Kyle's case, this is where his story really begins. My message is a pretty simple one. After high school, Kyle went on the speaking circuit. But before long, Kyle considered doing something he'd never really done before. 
quit. I put on like 25, 30 pounds in like a three or four month book tour. It was just this period of time where I was just like, blah. People would say to me after a speech that my story was inspiring and all that. I know that their intent was that it would make me feel good, but a lot of times it didn't. You know, a lot of times it just made me feel different. During this time, Kyle came up with a nickname for himself, the depressed motivational speaker. I was alone. You know, I would be traveling. I'd be up in a hotel room by myself. You know, I, did, I was 19 years old, 20 years old. And I'm speaking on stage with senators and presidents and like, you know, for Fortune 500 companies. And it's like, who am I to go and tell you guys how to run your business? Like, it was crazy. And I think a big part of it was I did not feel like authentic with the message that I was sharing. I didn't feel like, like I was actually living the message that I was talking about. And then a turning point, a chance meeting at an airport with two soldiers who said they saw Kyle on TV and were inspired by his life. You know, I think that made a huge difference in, in learning to accept that, embrace it, and wanting to be anything that I do, put my feet into, be the best in the world that I can be. You know, I'm competitive. And I think that, that was a big game changer for me. In 2011, Kyle met a Gold Star mother. Her son, Corey Johnson, had been killed in Afghanistan earlier that year. She told Kyle that her son had always wanted to travel and see Mount Kilimanjaro. And soon, Kyle had a new challenge. I told my friend that night, I'm gonna climb Mount Kilimanjaro. She was like, you're crazy. Like, how do you think you're gonna go and do Kilimanjaro? And I told her, I don't know, but we'll figure it out. Kilimanjaro has been called the house of God. It's so high that climbers will pass through five ecological zones before getting to the summit. Temperatures range from 80 degrees at the base to minus 15 degrees at the top. It's a taxing climb for anyone, but Kyle wouldn't back down. I've got some really amazing people in my life that I've been so fortunate to have that when I say something crazy like that, instead of them telling me, oh, you're crazy, you're not gonna go and do it, most of them are like, wow, that's cool. How can I help? I've got friends that made my gear out of duct tape and duct tape bath towels on the ends of my arms and my feet. I couldn't just go to like the hiking store and like get like a pair of hiking shoes. Like I had to have, we had to come up with a whole new system. Now there are risks to the climb. The higher you go, the less oxygen there is to breathe. You're doing great. The colder it gets, the greater the risk for frostbite. Not to mention the dust or the dry rocks. Kyle was gonna deal with this for 30 miles crawling every inch of the way. Most times, I'm literally, my face is in the dirt, six inches off the ground. Nobody really told me that I shouldn't bear crawl on my elbows and knees for 30 miles before I went. My shoulders and back and hip were shot, my arms, like the swelling in my arms was really intense. So it's this total dichotomy going on of some moments of just intense suffering, like, why am I here? Why did I do this? To other moments of like, wow, this is really cool. This is really beautiful. And connecting to that reason of just why I was there in the first place. After a grueling journey, Kyle was near the top. But the important thing wasn't just how close he was to the summit. It was how far he'd already come. I'm sitting on ice, and I'm looking back, and I could see the entire trail that we'd come up. And it was the wildest thing to go and see. The trail just went on and on and on forever, like out of sight. And I was like, holy cow, like, wow, like, we actually went that far. Like, it's amazing. Hemingway once wrote, all he could see as wide as the world was a square top of Kilimanjaro. And then he knew that there was where he was going. Kyle Maynard was there, 19,000 feet in the air, as the first quadruple amputee to summit the mountain. And once again, he beat the impossible. Uh, <laughs> I held it together at the top uh, until I called my mom and she started crying and I just broke. And I started crying after that too. And a couple moments after that, I got to pay tribute to a fallen soldier. You know, in those really tough moments where I was feeling sorry for myself and ready to quit, a lot of it was thinking, man, he's never gonna get this chance to be here and go and climb this mountain. And it, it really kept me going. It just absolutely was, it was the greatest honor of my life. Kyle returned home and earned an ESPY award for his efforts. He also came back with a different perspective. And now, He's not just working to conquer the impossible, he's helping others do the same. And I've learned whatever gifts that we've been giving, like you gotta go and share it. 
And sometimes that means doing things that are uncomfortable that every fiber in your body doesn't want you to do. Then you gotta do it anyway. When I was younger, I did pray a lot that like I would just wake up and have arms and legs. Now I think those prayers have been answered in a, in a totally different way, in a way that I couldn't have ever imagined before. It's come in the form of the learning that I've gotten to have, and that can transcend into anything. Now there's nothing in the world that you could offer me to have me live my life again differently. I feel like it's the biggest blessing I've ever received being born the way that I was.